Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you to the first uh, Sager Speaker Series of this academic year. Uh, I think many of you know, maybe all of you know, that an anonymous donor founded um, an endowed fund for the Sager Series to honor uh, a, a great Wake Forest alumnus from the class of 1976, uh, Tom Sager. Tom Sager spent much of his professional life as uh, general counsel and vice president of DuPont, where he was a strong early advocate for diversity in the legal profession. And he used his platform to help make uh, general counsel's offices look more like the public and the, the entities that they served. Um, he also started the DuPont legal model, which is now an industry benchmark for the business of practicing law and a model that's now recognized as decades ahead of its time. Uh, Mr. Sager, would you mind standing and let us recognize you? He'll fuss at me for that afterwards. Uh, Mr. Sager is now a, a partner at Ballard Spar in its Delaware office. He is a member of our board of visitors, law board of visitors, and he serves in a role you might not know, you should, it's um, ADCACO, advisor the dean can always count on. <laughs> so we're grateful for uh, his being here today. And uh, I want to say that this, this is a wonderful way to start the Sager series, both Mr. Sager and our speaker today. Demonstrate pretty dramatically what we all know, that uh, a lawyer's most precious asset is her judgment. Uh, again and again, in times of tragedy, we have turned to Mr. Feinberg. Uh, he has served as administrator of the September 11th Victims Compensation Fund, reaching out to the families of victims. He set up the system for claims and evaluations, determining the awards and disseminating them. He wrote about this powerful, extraordinary experience in a 2005 book, uh, What is Life Worth?, and a follow-up book in 2012, Who Gets What? Uh, but his service had begun long before, uh, uh, 30 years before that, he served as the administrator for funds to compensate victims of, ancient or of Agent Orange, which uh, in that powerful Ken Burns series, we were being reminded of uh, that war and the role of A Agent Orange. Uh, again and again, we turn to him. He's overseen programs to compensate victims of sexual abuse by the Roman Catholic clergy claimants in the Volkswagen scandal, payouts to the uh, BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the Aurora Victim Relief Fund from the tragedy in Aurora, Colorado, administrator of the Virginia Tech Hokie Spirit Memorial Fund, and most, or one of the recent um, incidents, uh, the, uh, the one fund from, for the victims and families in the uh, Boston Marathon shootings. He is a graduate of NYU Law School, so he and Professor Peoples might have traded some stories. I know he just talked to Professor Peoples' torts class. Uh, and he um, began his law career in public service. He then became uh, the founding partner of Kay Scholler in its Washington office, and now practices in a three-person firm, am I right? In the, in the Feinberg group. Occasionally, a law dean will figure out how to persuade him to come teach as an adjunct, and I'm gonna want some tips in, on that. Uh, I am just, I could not be uh, uh, more delighted to ask you to welcome, to join me in welcoming Ken Feinberg. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, before we uh, start uh, with our wonderful speaker today, I just want to uh, thank the provost's office 
Uh, this program is also being co-sponsored by the Rethinking Community series, and I want to thank the university for their support in that. I also want to follow up on the dean's comments and recognize Tom Sager. It's because of his uh, friendship uh, with Kenneth Feinberg, and he was key making this actually happen today. Um, Tom is considered the gold standard as far as general counsels, and he's even a better person. Um, I had the good fortune of working with him earlier on in my career, and I have the privilege of calling him a friend all these years after them. Uh, I want to say what a great honor it is to have you here today, one of the top lawyers in the country, and someone who represents the highest ideals of our profession. I want to start off, what we're going to do is probably for the next 30 minutes have a conversation. And what I'd like to start off with are um, your background. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from, why did you go to law school, um, what experiences shaped you, and who are your mentors? Wow. It's a lot in there. It's a lot in there. I grew up in an urban blue collar town, Brockton, Massachusetts, home of Rocky Marciano, former <laughs> heavyweight champ. And um, graduated Brockton High School, went to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. While I was at the University of Massachusetts, I thought about going to graduate school in drama um, and pursue a career in the theater. My father told me that he had a better idea. Go to law school and take your talents, your dramatic talents, and turn them into the courtroom and a much more um, certain profession. So I went to NYU Law School a few years before Professor Peoples, and um, that was the beginning of my law career. I clerked for the chief judge of New York State, Stanley Fold, and went into private practice. But before I went into private practice, I had the greatest job in America. I was chief of staff for a few years to Senator Ted Kennedy. And that was an extraordinary opportunity, working closely with uh, then colleagues, Stephen Breyer, who's now on the Supreme Court, and David Boies of Boies Schiller in New York. And we had a wonderful time. Then I went into private practice and uh, uh, the rest is history. Okay. Now, as far as your experiences prior to what you're doing now, what do you consider your breakthrough opportunity? Breakthrough opportunity for me, the dean mentioned. In 1984, without any training at all in ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, I got a call from J Judge Jack Weinstein, federal judge in Brooklyn. I knew the judge. He had clerked for Fold also, the Court of Appeals. And Judge Weinstein asked me to become the mediator and claims administrator in the Agent Orange litigation involving Vietnam veterans who claimed injury due to exposure to the herbicide Agent Orange while serving in Vietnam. Well, once that case settled, and once I began administering the claims of veterans, I started receiving telephone calls from all over the country. I have a case for you to mediate. Help me with that case. Help me with this case. I need a mediator. I need an arbitrator. And that started a career, clearly uh, a complete, um, unanticipated career brought on by Judge Weinstein and Agent Orange, really. Mm -hmm. um, now I want to talk a little bit about uh, alternative dispute resolution. Um, a lot of the students in the audience, uh, some of them are first years, they're familiar with judges, uh, lawyers, courts, uh, and particularly the adversarial process as it plays out in that particular forum. But they know a, a bit less about alternative dispute resolution, mediation, arbitration, as well as negotiations. Could you provide some insight into that focusing on some of the routine aspects of your practice. First, the adversarial system. You choose your lawyer, they'll choose their lawyer, judge and jury. Here to stay. None of this ADR alternative discussion will ever replace the importance of the adversarial system of trial by jury in our society. It is ingrained 
in the history of our country, the adversarial system. It's part of our heritage. It's not going to change. Having said that, there have been, over the last 30, 40 years, there's been a trend where more and more individuals, companies, entities see mediation, arbitration, negotiation as a viable alternative in certain situations to the adversarial traditional trial by battle. In corporations, no one in this country, I think I'm safe to say this, was more attuned to the appropriate role of ADR in a corporate setting than Tom Sager. Sager was one of the handful of general counsels who recognized there may be situations where conventional litigation should be not replaced but supplemented by a more efficient, streamlined way to get certainty. And DuPont, uh, under Tom, I think was one of the handful of companies with General Electric, the Department of the Air Force in the federal government, the EEOC in the federal government, that the, these sort of individuals and, and these entities that saw the wisdom of considering alternative ways to get to yes without litigating. Okay. It's interesting. A lot of times when you think about alternative dispute resolution, you think about something that's private, um, a private solution outside of the public eye. Uh, the irony is that uh, a lot of your career has been spent in the public eye. You've been thrust into that, uh, particularly your work administering and also designing these compensation programs. So I'd like now to talk about uh, some of those programs in particular. And if you could, uh, talk about, in the wake of the 9-11 horrific attacks, your work with the 9-11 Compensation Fund. Thirteen days after 9-11, Congress passed a law. And the law simply said anybody who lost a loved one on 9-11, airplanes, World Trade Center, Pentagon, or anybody who was physically injured as a result of the terrorist attacks, can voluntarily opt out of the legal system. Don't sue the World Trade Center, Boeing, United, Continental, Massport, the Port Authority, the security guard companies. Instead, opt out. Come into a no-fault administrative compensation program funded entirely by the taxpayer. Public money. You don't have to, but 97% did come into the fund. And over the 33-month life of that program, I distributed $7.1 billion to 5,300 victims, dead and injured. They signed a release, I will not sue. That was the program. The program worked exactly as Congress intended. It was a great success. Don't ever do it again. Don't ever do that again, a 9-11 fund using public money. I think it was the right thing to do in, in light of the 9-11 attacks. Don't replicate it. Bad things happen to good people every day in this country. There's no 9-11. I didn't see a 9-11 fund for Maria, a hurricane, Jose, these hurricanes in Florida and Texas, Harvey. I didn't see a 9-11 fund after Katrina. A thousand people died after Katrina in New Orleans. You better be careful about singling out for very special treatment only these victims. Everybody else, fend for yourself. So I, can, uh, I think the 9-11 Fund is, 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 uh, was a wonderful example of community empathy for victims. But um, let's study it in a history class rather than a law school class. Okay. And can you elaborate on how uh, the claim amounts were determined? You have to have studied tort one at Wake Forest. <laughs> if you don't know tort one, 
and you didn't take people's class, you're in trouble. <laughs> the law spelled out, how do you calculate damages for the dead and injured? The same way you calculate damages if you get hit by an automobile crossing the street here at the law school. One, what would the person, the victim, have earned over a work life but for the tragedy? Economic loss, chapter five of the tort book. Two, add something for pain and suffering, emotional distress. Again, chapter five of the tort law book. That's basically how we calculated the damages. It's not rocket science. It was, there are people in this room, uh, not only Professor Peoples, but there are other people in this room who could do exactly what I did in 9-11 in, in terms of calculating the damages. That's not rocket science. We do it every day in every court in the country. No, I thought it was really interesting when you were talking about the compensation programs in your, in your book. Um, you talked about the elements of a successful one, but you also uh, highlighted the fact of hearings, um, the opportunity for individuals to meet face-to-face, -face, meet face-to-face -face and tell their particular story. Can you talk about where that fits into this overall compensation scheme? You know, that, it's a critical component. If you're going to run an assembly line program, you know, let's get the money out to victims. They need it. That's fine. Very efficient. Very cost effective. But you better build into these programs when you can, when it's feasible, an opportunity for the victim or his or her family to be heard one-on-one. -on -one. During the 9-11 fund, I conducted 950 separate hearings with victims. And whereas the calculation of damages is, is not rocket science and is pretty pro forma, brace yourself for the hard part, meeting the victims, the anger, the frustration, the disappointment, the sorrow, the pathos, that's what gets to you, the emotional part. The legal part is pretty straightforward. It's the emotional part. If you don't have the fortitude, don't do it because you're, you're dealing with, you know, a law degree, better a divinity degree or a degree in psychiatry because you're dealing with very vulnerable people and you better be prepared for the worst. Okay. Essential. People leave the office and they'll go, I lost my wife. Feinberg heard me, the government. I had a chance to explain, to validate the memory of a lost loved one, to vent about life's unfairness, it helps the credibility of the program and others come in when they hear these stories. Okay. Now, one of the other things I, I wanted to highlight uh, before we get and talk about some of these other compensation arrangements, I want you to talk about uh, what you got paid to do this, uh, the uh, concept of pro bono and, and why it's important. Well. Look, when, when I was asked by the Attorney General of the United States, John Ashcroft, and President Bush to design and administer the 9-11 Fund, I told them that I would only do it uh, pro bono. I didn't want to be paid. And they couldn't believe it. I said, you can't, it's a patriotic duty, 9-11? I mean, I would be, not only is it the, would it be wrong to take money, but you would be vilified by the very people you're trying to help. So when I do these, these uh, programs like the Boston Marathon, Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut, Aurora, Colorado, the Dark Knight movie shootings, um, One Fun Boston, The Pulse, Orlando Supper Club, the nightclub, uh, terrorist attack. I do those programs pro bono. I think it's the right thing to do. It doesn't take that much time. And I think it's, it's part of my duty as a citizen. 
when I do BP <laughs> or General Motors, <laughs> I make up for it. <laughs> I mean, I may be dumb, but I'm not stupid. I mean, an international oil cartel or General Motors? Spare me pro bono then. Volkswagen? You know, Volkswagen, Volkswagen wasn't that uh, difficult. You know, it's, you guys will get this. Volkswagen, the recall of an automobile. I mean, really. Nobody died. Nobody was physically injured. Fix the car or get a new one. But I mean, uh, it was an environmental problem. But if people say, did it rise to the level of 9-11 or GM or BP, no, and I was, uh, someone had told me to ask you a question about opera music. And about? Uh, opera music. Opera. And, and where that fits in. <laughs> ask my friend Bruce Eisen right here in the front row. He, um, I'm a big opera fan, and I'll tell you, when you do these programs like 9-11, where there's death and injury and the worst of civilization, it's an outlet at night when you go home to listen to the height of civilization. You need some peace, symphonies, concert music, chamber works, something to get your mind off the horror of the day. Um, no, the opera's a big, a big part of, uh, of my extracurricular life, yeah. Um, now I want to talk about another, uh, I guess another task that you were uh, a role that you were tasked with, and that was serving as special master uh, for TARP executive compensation. And if you could elaborate on that and what that experience was like. Obviously, it's not the horror of 9-11. No, it was a sideshow. It was a sideshow. You'll remember, after the 2008 and 9 financial crisis in this country, Congress passed a law, and the law provided billions of dollars in tax, taxpayer assistance to keep corporate America afloat. AIG, GM, Chrysler, Citibank, Bank of America. Congress provided this, these loans to, to, to bail out corporate America, not DuPont. Congress then passed another law. Well, if we gave all of this money to corporate America, we are the American people acting through Congress. We are creditors. These banks, uh, these companies owe us money. So we're going to take populist revenge. And we're going to pass a law that says the Department of the Treasury will determine compensation for the highest corporate officials in seven companies that took the most taxpayer help. So for 16 months, I got a call from President Obama, Secretary of the Treasury, Geithner. We want you to set the pay for the top 25 corporate officials in seven banks, uh, seven uh, major financial institutions like Bank of America. Well, I mean, really? Not really. You want the Department of the Treasury to determine the pay for private corporate officials? I mean, I couldn't, Tom Sago couldn't stop laughing when I told him about this assignment. Um, Really, that's not the role of the Department of the Treasury, but Congress passed a law. So for 16 months, I took evidence and determined and calculated what the top 25 people in these seven companies, that's all, 175 people, what they would get. And when you repaid the taxpayer, you were out from under my thumb. 
So a couple of these companies borrowed money to get out from under my thumb <laughs> to repay the taxpayer. But that's how it worked. It was very interesting. Now, I'll tell you one interesting aspect about that assignment. You would think that when you set pay for a private, a CFO, a CEO, vice president and general counsel, uh, vice president for human resources, you would think that won't get that emotional. Spare me. <laughs> it is very emotional, and I'll tell you why. When you go to a CFO at a company, and you say that under the law, I'm going to cut your pay 50%, you better brace yourself. Because that CFO is going to come back and say to you, how dare you? You don't even know what I do. My compensation, when I look in the mirror in the morning, my compensation is a reflection of my own self-worth. Not that I'm on the board of the church, not that I have a wonderful family, not that I'm community-minded. My compensation mirrors my own view of my success. And you cut me 50% and you are demeaning my dignity and my evaluation of self. Now you may, as I do, you may look at that as a little bit skewed, I must say. <laughs> Try telling that to the victim, the corporate official, who says, the harm done by my company, I, no I had nothing to do with it. Wasn't on my watch, and yet you're cutting my pay. What do you have against me and my family? So you learn that any time you tinker in a free society like ours with capitalism, with, with, with money, with compensation as consideration for value, you better be prepared to take the heat because, uh, again, you've got to be a shrink when you're dealing with people. It's hard. And I'm sure when you were uh, serving um, as special master in that particular context, people would often bring up the clients, particularly companies, that if you set compensation so low, uh, we're not going to be able to attract people, but we're also going to lose people to other companies. And even worse, we're going to lose them to competitors. Oh, you hear that all the time. <laughs> Here's what they say. It's almost like a script in a movie theater. <laughs> if you don't give my CFO $5 million instead of the $2.5 million, she's going to leave. And you know where she's going to go, Mr. Feinberg? She's not going to go across the street to DuPont. She's going to go to China. Everybody's going to China in this program. <laughs> if you don't pay them, everybody's leaving for China. <laughs> and and uh, I heard that all the time. Well, we didn't buy it for a minute. And... You know, people stick around for a lot of reasons, not only related to money. People stick around, they like the culture of a firm, they like their place at the firm, it's close to home, it's close to their church, they like, the, uh, they like, they like driving to work, they have a parking space. Um, it's, you know, there are a lot of factors that go into a personal decision to stick around. And uh, nobody went to China. And most of those people didn't leave and even go across the street to DuPont. Most of them stayed uh, right where they were. And what would you say was the primary purpose then of setting executive compensation in those companies? You mean Congress, why they did it? Why they did it. Wanted some political cover. Here we are in Congress bailing out Citigroup. I mean, it's sort of laughable when you think about it. AIG. We're giving taxpayer money to prop up these companies, and I understand why. Hank Paulson, the Secretary of the Treasury, and Tim Geithner, two different administrations, Bush and Obama. They both agreed, we've got to, got to save these companies, or they'll be like Lehman Brothers. So we'll prop them up. That was the motivation, but if, that, if that's a sound public policy, 
we better protect our flank from the populist wave by telling the world, yeah, we propped them up, but we're going to now set their pay. And um, I remember talking to Senator Shelby of Alabama, great guy. I said, Senator, you know, I'm doing this. I hope you don't, you don't think it's socialism or something. I mean, you, he says, well, we passed the law. I can't blame you. But I don't want you to expand your operation beyond these seven companies. I don't want you to start looking at eight companies or ten companies. or No, 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 no. Just these seven. Because Congress said so. And that was the end of it. And we cut the pay. I think the pay's now doubled since. <laughs> I mean, the minute you go back to the marketplace, the marketplace, capitalism, it takes over. So I'm asked all the time, did you do any good? I go, I enjoyed it. I don't know if any good. <laughs> it was an interesting assignment to go to work every day. I don't know if it made much difference. Well, now I'd like to uh, you know, switch gears and talk about another compensation arrangement, uh, the Gulf Coast Claims Facility, or the BP Oil Spill Fund. Can you talk about that and how that differs from some of your other engagements? BP, I'll tell you how it differs. The BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico in, in, in 2010 resulted in my receiving 1,250,000 claims in 16 months. I got claims from 50 states. I think I got 40 claims from North Carolina. I never, know that the, I never thought the oil got up to North Carolina. <laughs> I got claims from 35 foreign countries, Nigeria, China, Norway, England, all asking for money. We were harmed by the oil spill. So what make, made the BP oil spill so different from anything I've ever done, volume, volume. I had, at the height of the BP oil spill fund, 4,300 employees. We set up 35 offices along the Gulf, from Galveston to Mobile Bay. And we just received claim after claim, almost all of them business losses, business interruption. They closed the Gulf. I couldn't fish. I couldn't shrimp. I couldn't oyster harvest. My hotel on the beach lost all customers, all guests. They canceled because of the oil spill. Well, we had to process, you know, we found of 1,250,000 claims, we found about 550,000 eligible. We paid out in 16 months, six and a half billion dollars. Received 225,000 releases from businesses and individuals. It worked! It worked. We, 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 we um, satisfied or we processed 92% of all eligible claims from the oil spill. I doubt you'll ever see that again either. A company fronted, put up in advance of claim one, $20 billion. I mean, uh, President Obama, he, he, he insisted that they put up $20 billion. I said, Mr. President, $20 billion? No program in the world is going to cost $20 billion. Shh, just process the claims. We paid $6.5 billion. And now BP paid maybe $80 billion or $100 billion in terms of everything else, cleanup and fines and uh, EPA violations and all of that. But the claims program, it worked pretty well. The volume was a problem. Um, I remember you had previously stated the importance of face-to-face -face contact. Um, in the context of 9-11 and some of your other engagements. How did that play out in the context of the BP oil spill? And I, I remember reading about some of your town hall meetings. How did they go? Well, the town hall meetings, you know, were, were open to the public down in the Gulf to explain the program. Well, you take a lot of baloney, you know. You know, you're a Yankee from Washington. You get up down there in the, in the Gulf parishes. Who hears from Louisiana? Yeah, you won't raise your hand, but, <laughs> but that was like another world. Now, there were no private meetings, not with 1,250,000 claims. You can't hold private meetings. 
you allow people to go into a claims office in the Gulf and get one-on-one -on -one treatment. It's not a hearing. They'll help you process the claim. But these town hall meetings were fabulous, fascinating. I went, one, I went to one town hall meeting down in Plaquemines Parish, 50 miles southeast of New Orleans. 300 fishermen crowded into a school gymnasium. So I get up to explain the program. It's a true story. I get up to explain the program, and the president of the parish says, we are indeed fortunate. Mr. Feinberg is here to explain the BP oil spill compensation program and answer your questions. Mr. Feinberg is a model public citizen, a model that he's doing this to help us recover from the oil spill. So I explained the program. And the president says, now we'll take some questions. And a fisherman in the back row grabs the mic and he says, well, Mr. Feinberg, we're certainly glad you came down here today, and I note, having listened to you, I note what the president said of our parish in introducing you. He said you're a model public citizen, and I want to confirm for everybody here, you are a model. You know what a model is, Feinberg? A small replica of the real thing. <laughs> uh, the town hall meeting went downhill after that. <laughs> um, but I think town hall meetings, in terms of getting people to understand what the program is all about, the devil you know, rather, the devil you know rather than the devil you don't know, I think helps a lot in explaining to people. And I think they appreciate when you walk into the lion's den and you're willing to take the heat. And I think that helped. Well, now I want to eventually get to uh, open it up for questions, but I had a, a couple of questions uh, just generally related to uh, your career and, and reflecting on that. Uh, what has been the most rewarding part of your career? 9-11. I know Tom Sagan is going to be upset. I would have said representing DuPont in some very innovative mediations and arbitrations and very creative corporate resolution of disputes at DuPont. We worked together for a decade on some of these. But I would say the 9-11 fund and the unprecedented nature of that tragedy was rivaled probably only by the Civil War and Pearl Harbor and the assassination of President Kennedy. I think uh, doing that and getting 97% of the people to sign up voluntarily and go through all of that, I would say that was my, uh, gave me the most satisfaction. Mm -hmm. um, if you think about it, uh, what mistakes you, have you learned the most from? Every time you do one of these, you make mistakes. If you take on one of these assignments, very emotional, you're dealing with very vulnerable people, I guarantee you make terrible blunders. I'll never forget, you guys will, you'll, you'll understand this. I'll never forget, in 9-11, an 82-year-old man came to see me privately. And he was crying. And he said, Mr. Feinberg, I want you to know, I lost my son at the Pentagon. When the plane hit the building, he escaped, but he thought that his sister, who also worked at the Pentagon, was trapped. He went back in to look for her. She had escaped through a side door. He died looking for her. And this poor old man, he said, Mr. Feinberg, my life is over. A father should never have to bury a son. I'm just going through the motions, and I'll never be the same. And I looked at him, and I said to him, Mr. Jones, this is terrible. I know how you feel. 
My two aides like kicked me under the desk. What are you doing? This guy looked at me and he said, Mr. Feinberg, you know, you have a tough job. It's not easy what you have to do. I want to give you some friendly advice. Don't ever tell somebody like me that you know how I feel. You have no idea how I feel. And it, it rings hollow. I'll never do that again. And you learn when you meet with people and you want to exhibit empathy, the best way to exhibit empathy is shut up. Just listen. Because there is nothing. These people want to go on and wax eloquent about a lost loved one. Don't even try to commiserate directly. Be a good listener. Thank them for coming. The less you say, the better. Otherwise, it'll come back to haunt you if you're not careful. And uh, the one last question that I have is, if you could offer some advice uh, to aspiring lawyers in the room, what would it be? That's easy. If I have any advice, absolutely Tom Sager will agree with me on this. Absolutely. If I have one bit of advice, it is don't plan too far ahead. Law students have a, have a tendency to start thinking about what they want to be doing 10 years from now. Well, if I go into a law firm, I'll go up there. But if I don't do that, then later on I can't come in laterally. And if I take a government job, then I'll be, I won't be able to go into private practice. And if I don't take the government, forget that. Especially at a school like Wake Forest. I mean, you know, you're not going, you're not going to law school out of a truck. It is Wake Forest after all. <laughs> I wouldn't worry too much. One thing I've learned over the years don't plan too far ahead. Life has a way of changing the best laid plans. You may think you know what you're going to be doing two years from now. Believe me, you don't. You may think, I'm certain I want to do that. Two years later, three years later, you're doing something completely different. Take a job if you can. Now, sometimes there's financial issues and loans, and I understand that. Try and take a job where you like getting up Monday morning and love take, accepting the, the work and the challenge. And don't worry too much about what you're going to be doing uh, with your law school career four, five, ten years from now. I see every day people who thought they knew what life had in, had in store for them. And after 9-11 and BP and all these other tragedies, believe me, you have no idea where life is going to take you. Curveballs come to everybody. So um, that's my fatherly advice. <laughs> all right, I'd like to open it up for um, any questions from the audience. A brave soul. You must be from Boston. <laughs> know where you're from? Raleigh. Where? Raleigh. Raleigh. Close. <laughs> so, so my question is, as you're working with TARP, and here you are, you're setting the salaries of 125 of uh, the top paid people in America. Did doing that sort of regulation cause you any difficulty down the road with other goals, other businesses? The fact that you probably made some rich folks a little unhappy? No. I think everybody who viewed what I did in top saw it as a sideshow. I'm glad to help the administration set pay. I mean, it isn't like these people got nothing. I mean, you mean you're going to have to take two and a half million instead of five? I mean, spare me a little bit. <laughs> but but um, um, it didn't. And, and, and here's another thing. I never worry. What will this mean if I do this? for my future. You start thinking that way and you stop taking challenges that really the government or presidents or attorneys general or DuPont or General Motors or General Electric are asking you to exercise your judgment. And um, I've never really thought for more than a minute, well, if I do this, 
will this hurt my professional standing down the road? People ask you to do something like this. They have confidence in you. You better do it, and you better do it to the best of your ability. No. Never enters my equation. Hi. Thank you for coming today. Um, I wanted to ask if your experience with the Catholic... Um, with the... With the Catholic abuse uh, fund was any different than all the ones you've talked about um, in terms of your role in and the type of people coming for claims? Well, it's, it, it, the, the question is, my current job right now, I'm trying to pay out claims in New York State at the request of Cardinal Dolan in New York. I'm paying out clergy sexual abuse claims, like Searchlight, that movie, Spotlight. So in New York, that's what we're doing right now. Now the question is, is it different in any way? I'll tell you uh, one way it's very different. All of these programs, every one of them, there's a different wrinkle. It's a very good question. He, here's what's different about Catholic Church sexual abuse claims. In every other fund that I've ever done, people quickly see are incentivized by compensation. And they immediately come in, like BP, a million two hundred and fifty thousand claims. The the money, the compensation that is available, very generous, results usually in a flood of claims. Not with the Catholic Church. Victims are embarrassed. These church claims happened 10, 20, 30 years ago. The statute of limitations has run. There's no litigation. They have tried, most of them, to move on from the horror. They have married. They have families. They have made the best of their lives despite the abuse as kids. Getting victims to come forward privately in confidence to see me or at least file a claim and get paid, very, very difficult. We know, I'll give you an example, we know in New York City, we estimated about, known, known to the church, 175 claims, individual claims. We have had tremendous difficulty getting those 175 people to apply. 400, 500,000, 300,000 dollars each. Return mail, unopened. No forwarding address. Um, so what's made that difficult, not the emotion, the emotion in all of these cases is difficult. It's a real horror. But what makes it difficult is finding how difficult it is to find the people who years ago complained and now have moved off into the wilderness and you can't find them to pay them. It's a problem. The best system. I, if I had to do BP over again with all of that volume, I wouldn't do too much differently. I would, I would lower expectations, I'll tell you that. I came in there promising these folks the world on, in, in a speedy way, not fully appreciating the volume of claims. And it did get bogged down, especially at the beginning. It did get bogged down, although I must say, when Louisiana congressional critics started beating up on me about the delay in getting money out to fishermen, I reminded them that I got out in the first three months about $180 million in emergency payments before the first trial was even scheduled in New Orleans. And yes, I think that was a mistake, raised expectations. The other mistake is BP 
decided after I had, had um, secured 92% of the real claims, they decided over my objection to prematurely end the program and implement a successor program, which had, oh, tons more problems. And they should have never, I, told, I warned them, they should have let my program go another year and they terminated it prematurely, and that was a problem. But during the time I administered the program, 16 months, I think it, was, uh, it worked very, very well, actually, especially once we started assembly line processing of the claims. Somebody else? Yes, ma'am. Is the advantage, and I'm not talking about the government funds, but the corporate funds, is the advantage to the corporation that they don't have to pay punitive damages and they come out overall? Uh, I mean, I, I understand that it's a crapshoot for the, the, the plaintiffs, but is there any kind of public policy argument in the punitives aren't? Uh, they also avoid a lot of publicity on negligence. So the question is, what advantages is it for GM or BP? to set up these special programs with me. What do they get? Well, Tom Sager can answer that question better than I can. I'll tell you what I think are some of the advantages, and you mentioned them. One, reputational. We do not want to be Exxon Valdez litigating these cases for the next 20 years. We're in the oil business. We're not in the claims business. And we are getting vilified. In the, public, uh, in the public eye with this litigation and this ongoing horror. We would rather cabinize the problem and get it behind us. It's an alternative to litigation. It's more cost effective. Exxon takes the position millions for defense, not one cent for tribute. That's a company policy. Reputational. We want to be a good citizen, GM and the ignition switches. We want to do right by the victims. Economic, financially, here's an interesting issue for the business school. I find it amazing that when BP or GM announce that there will be a Feinberg-style program, it'll cost us $20 billion, BP, $600 million, GM the stock price soars. People see there's an, a, a light at the end of the tunnel. It may cost them money, but they've got it, the certainty. Companies love certainty. What will this cost? We'll book it and get it behind us. Now, having said that, I only know of very, very few companies that are doing, uh, that have agreed to do what GM and BP did. It is not the American way. And, and so I tell people all the time, here's the advantage to the company, but I'm not sure many people are listening. I'm not sure that companies are going to do this. I haven't seen anybody replicate BP or GM under those circumstances. So I don't think, I think these are aberrations. There are real advantages, but I'm not sure that corporate America sees it. We'll see. I actually, I actually think we're going to close up, but what I wanted to do on behalf of uh, the Wake Forest community, thank you once again. It's a pleasure. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you.